Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Negotiation. On today's show, we speak with our good friend and past guest, Michael Zakur. Michael is not only a best-selling author on Amazon with China's Super Consumers and his latest release, New Retail, Born in China, Going Global, he is also the founder of Five New Digital. For our second recording with Michael, we focus quite a bit on the impact of COVID-19 as this really is the most important topic on all minds, including corporate and the brands they own and manage. We talk about which retailers are doing well versus those that aren't and what key strategies are making the biggest difference, bearing in mind that doing well has taken on a more subdued metric. We also look specifically at Chinese brands for some answers on both accounts as a country whose economy has come back online recently and some data points there that are starting to come in. We talk about changes in consumer trends that we can already see taking place and some predictions on more to come. We end with a look back to the last pandemic of this magnitude, the Spanish flu, and track the outcomes on consumers then, through until today, trying to make sense of what we're going through, especially as a business owner would, and the opportunities for entrepreneurs who might be buoyed by some strong tailwinds of opportunity. Enjoy. We're getting flooded with retailers and brands and companies who either want to enter China or increase their sales in China because they're looking at what their outlook in the U.S. and Europe is going to be for the rest of the year and possibly, you know, well into next year. And it really doesn't look good. And so as China is emerging strongly from from the crisis on their end, consumer demand is is there and it's going to surge, I believe, even more coming up to the 618 holiday. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia-Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market no globally-minded brand should ignore, but entering markets like China is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber, and Facebook. Times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early-stage tech companies enter the Asia-Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley, and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Michael, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you on again. Good to be back. Thank you. Your landscape has changed uh, since the last time we talked, so why don't you bring everybody up to date with what you're doing now and what your new company is? Sure. Yeah, in September of 19, uh, I founded a new company called Five New Digital, Um, and it's a a company focused on uh, the new retail, the new consumption, the new technology, the new finance, and the new supply chain uh, that make up the uh, new retail revolution. And so we work with companies globally uh, on transforming how they think about and operate uh, for an ecosystem and habitat driven consumer world rather than a channel driven uh, product based world. So we work with companies from Europe and the US uh, on their global uh, digital and retail operations. And we also have a subsidiary in China called China Bright Star. And uh, we continue to do the work there we've been doing for 15 years on working with brands and retailers and companies on their China consumer market um, and digital commerce strategy. All right, let's kick things off this time with a broad discussion of retailers around the world that are doing well right now, despite the COVID-19 pandemic that we were all suffering through right now? Well, it's a a pretty short list. Um, And I think it's right now less about which retailers are doing well, and it's more about um, which integrated systems are doing well. So we can kind of look back a couple months here at China first, and as China was going through the worst Uh, of the COVID crisis, Uh, one thing that really held the country together in some respects were the ecosystems for retail, commerce, and communication that Alibaba, JD, Tencent, uh, Pinduoduo, and Kaola had built, but especially the Alibaba, JD, Tencent ecosystems. And these systems were the complete integration of online, offline technology and supply chain. And each one of them was built to be an equal power source for a single ubiquitous 
environment for consumers to be able to order from anywhere, pick up from anywhere, get delivered from anywhere. You know, one of the, the first things we saw develop in China in the early days of the crisis was contactless delivery. It's become a part of the common language here in the U.S., but that term actually started in China in January as delivery people and Alibaba and um, people in their homes figured out new and inventive ways to have things delivered to them without any contact. And so what we really saw was the ability to use digital technology, integrate that with orders and deliveries. I mean, think about what a role that Alibaba's uh, Fresh Hippo stores played in acting as forward operating distribution uh, and inventory spaces, not only as stores. That ecosystem proved to be the most resilient thus far in this crisis globally. Um, we can only imagine how bad things might have been in China if tens and even hundreds of millions of people um, were not able to order from home using an app and you know, have products delivered to them anywhere you know, from 24 to 36 hours. And if you kind of look at what the corollary here is in the United States, we're not doing as well on that front. So there are some companies who are doing well. In my opinion, Target is one of them. When I wrote the book, The New Retail, and even prior to that, when I started talking about who the seven companies of the future would be that would build these giant ecosystems and who would prove to be uh, the people who are really in control of retail and commerce in the future, in addition to Amazon and Alibaba and JD and Tencent, I always added Target and Walmart in there. And you can imagine five years ago, um, I got a lot of funny looks when I told people that I felt like um, Target and Walmart were on track to master the new retail. But what's happened now is Target invested so much money in their app. In my opinion, it's the best retail app in the United States. And all of the logistics and technology integration, they have fully integrated their online and physical re re um, retail stores. And so I can order something from my Target app. They'll tell me, you know, it's going to be ready for you in two hours. Then they'll update me and say, actually, 30 minutes later, it's ready for you. Come. As I'm driving to the store, they say, we see you're only two miles out. We see you're one mile out. We see you're 600 feet away. Our guy is standing on the corner, and here's what he's wearing. On the other side, for delivery, we're averaging whether it's groceries, essentials, toys, games, anything to keep us sane as we're in lockdown. Um, we're averaging three to four days delivery for almost everything from Target stores. Conversely, um, anything that we've tried to order from Amazon over the last three weeks um, at a minimum has a two week delivery time. But it, and it, at this point, you know, more to a month and a month and a half. But I think the big story coming out of this was, you know, we were moving towards this complete integration of online, offline technology and logistics, not nearly quick enough. But this crisis globally has accelerated the China model of retail. Um, and now you see convenience stores and Panera Bread is now starting to stock and sell groceries. And so the idea of having these forward operating logistics spaces and a complete integration online, offline. And the narrative has really shifted here um, from, you know, Amazon was the savior to Amazon is the problem. And it's actually the local grocers and convenience stores and Targets and Walmarts who are really saving the day. I know that to be accepted as a seller on Tmall, there are a lot of things that you need to go through and there's a lot of things you need to prove, such as a lot of inventory in the region are the lower restrictions and barriers to entry to being a seller on Amazon part of the problem here in this regard? Well, yeah. <clears throat> well sure. That's a, that's a major difference between, uh, you know, Tmall, Tmall Global, Taobao, and Amazon. Um, virtually anybody can set up a presence and um, sell on Amazon. You know, it's pretty much, uh, you know, if you're following the rules and the regs and, you know, doing things the right way, um, yeah, anybody can set up. Uh, whereas with Tmall and JD, you have to go through a, um, you know, a rigorous application process. You need to be accepted by the platform. Um, you need to put a deposit down to ensure uh, that any consumers who, you know, need a refund or if you're not treating the consumer well, there's a fund for that. But most importantly, yeah, you have to show them that you have a marketing plan, that you have a logistics plan, 
um, that you have inventory and you know, you'll, you'll very quickly find yourself, um, falling out of the good graces of Alibaba if you fall short on logistics and inventory. Um, so it's a big, big difference there for sure. Okay. So let's expand on that. How, how does a retailer go about that? Because I think there's a lot of retailers around the world with a lot of inventory and some warehouses that would love to move it. And China seems like an obvious place, but that seems like a lot of work to take on yourself and understand how to go through that labyrinth of getting set up and running over in China. Yeah, it's not something that that's easy to do on your own. Um, you know, my, my clients um, range from first, second stage startups all the way to the top 100 largest uh, multinationals in the world. And when it comes to getting set up in China, <laughs> the only difference b- between the startup and the multinational is a the amount of money they have uh, or the amount of people they can put towards the problem. It's not always a case of um, the big guys understand better how the game is played there. Um, what's happening there right now, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm very fortunate that my business is, is thriving right now uh, with the China subsidiary because we're getting flooded with retailers and brands and companies who either want to enter China or increase their sales in China because they're looking at what their outlook in the U.S. and Europe is going to be for the rest of the year and possibly, you know, well into next year. And it really doesn't look good. And so as China is emerging strongly from, from the crisis on their end, consumer demand is, is there and it's going to surge, I believe, even more coming up to the 618 holiday. So what you really need to do uh, are two things. You need to work with somebody like a WPIC. Um, and you know we we call them trading partners or team all partners and they they handle the vast majority of the workload for you in getting set up operating in china and so if you think about uh, a wpic having you know a core four you know set of, of tools that they use it's to build and operate your digital store uh, on alibaba jd the other marketplaces um, it's to handle all customer service, pre, uh, live, post sale, to handle all of the logistics, picking, packing, and fulfillment, um, and then to be able to plan and execute your marketplace uh, advertising promotions and marketing plans. And then all of that being backed up by an incredible um, you know, data collection and analytics system, and you have Chinalytics and all the tools that come with that. But in general, the other thing that's happening now too is that Alibaba um, is making it easier and faster um, to get on and approved on the platform. And, you know, there are a few companies, uh, good trading partners out there like WPIC that the Alibabas and the JDs of the world trust where they've empowered them to do most of the vetting. Um, and giving them the tools to accelerate the application uh, build out and startup process. And so, you know, where we work really well together is, you know, having all that operational um, ability doesn't preclude you from having a, a China strategy and a market and a product and a category um, and a consumer strategy. And so, you know, what we're, one of the things we're doing together is we're putting together this package where um, we can do an accelerated strategy, startup operations and launch program in, you know, 30 to 60 days, um, something that normally would have taken maybe 90 to 180 days. And, and so having this package of strategy, understanding, research, um, and, and having the brand localization and then turning that into an actual operational launch is something that a lot of companies are, are looking for now and that we can provide. So at a high level, globally speaking, what do you think are going to be the key effects of COVID-19 on retail once we emerge from this crisis? Well, first and foremost, uh, unfortunately, it's going to accelerate um, the demise uh, of the companies that were just hanging on. Um, And I also think it's going to accelerate the demise uh, of the large format physical um, retail format. So, you you know, malls and department stores were in a heavy decline uh, pre-COVID. 
I, I don't see how many of them survive the post-COVID world. I mean, that was a, a decline that was happening anyway. So I, I think that's number one. Number two, uh, I think it's going to be a mix, and this is kind of counterintuitive, but at least in the West, in Europe and the U.S., um, I do think it's going to change the the e-commerce landscape in, in some very positive ways and in some very negative ways. I think that people are going to walk away with um, some very positive experiences from how marketplaces and retailers have been able to handle uh, online orders and delivery during the crisis. And, and some are going to walk away with some very negative feelings about how that process works. We say in the book, and I've said this for years, the difference between e-commerce and digital commerce and the new retail is that in the new retail, physical retail actually matters. It's very, very important. And, and that came as a revelation to people who think that the clicks were going to be the demise of the bricks. Um, it turns out physical really matters. And we've been saying that for a long time. The, the difference is how you use that physical presence um, how you integrate it with what you're doing digitally. And this is another game changer. The roles have been reversed, whereas who you were as a physical retailer in a lot of ways drove what you did online and digitally. And really now the, the sex, successful companies are letting the technology in the digital world drive how they integrate and use physical retail spaces. And I think there's been a huge rediscovery on the part of consumers that, you know, their local convenience store, their local grocery stores, their local Target, their local Walmart, um, these are going to be places that are going to be very, very important to them in the future. Um, and so, uh, like I said, you know, I gave you the Panera Bread example, you know, here's a restaurant that can't see people, so they're shifting to grocery. And so what you started to see um, pre-COVID was the lines between who's a retailer, who's a wholesaler, who's a grocery store, who's a pharmacy, who's a technology company, and who's a logistics company, all those lines were blurring already. Um, I think now from a consumer and um, you know, company level, people understand that you have to be some mix of all of those things. So how did Chinese platforms, companies, brands, how did they all cope with COVID-19? And what successful strategies and tactics did they use and where did they fall short? Well, I'll take the second part first. Um, I think, you know, in the, in the early days of the crisis in China, there were some bottlenecks in logistics and delivery. Um, you know, especially to some of the more far flung um, and rural, uh, you know, and especially in some of the tier three and tier four cities, um, you know, because as much as this system was set up, um, you know, to act as a, an efficient and fast ecosystem for commerce, um, you know, the systems were not ready for the shock that was COVID. So I think in the early part of the crisis, you know, that shock to the system um, took some, you know, uh, really heavy duty engineering brain power and logistics brain power um, and a lot of good technology people put their minds against it and they figured out how to loosen those bottlenecks, how to adjust. Um, I also think it took a lot of brave people, um, you know, people who were willing um, to, you know, get on that motor scooter and bring that package to an apartment complex. It took, you know, brave people at the, um, the warehouses and the distribution centers to, um, you know, keep the system moving. And I think the system that worked there also was, uh, you know, what, what may seem a bit heavy handed uh, to people in the West was, you know, the no fooling around separation, testing and quarantine of people. And it was the fast action on doing those three things that were key to separating the healthy from the unhealthy people and to keep the system working. Um, so I think if, you know, there was a problem to be overcome, it was that. What made it all work into the, in addition to the things I said, you know, the people who made it work, you know, you have to start with them was again, the system is four years ahead of where we are in the West in terms of how technology, logistics, online and offline were fully integrated, right? And so 
having all four of those elements acting in concert, having a system where, you know, for Tmall Global, right? Sure, it's an online marketplace, but Alibaba also has Tmall Global physical stores where you can walk in and see all the best selling items that are sold on Tmall Global and touch them, feel them, smell them, and then scan them with a QR code and have them delivered to you. Um, you know, having a uh, live streaming, you know, and the way live streaming is used, the way uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, all of the technologies that were integrated into this retail consumer system. And really you gotta think about what these systems were set up as not just a place to shop and buy and sell stuff, but they've become the operating system for life in China, right? So if you think about how deep and broad the WeChat ecosystem of products and services are for communication and entertainment and shopping and talking to each other, there's no super um, operating system for life from a social media perspective in the West that even approaches what WeChat can do. Well, by the same token, there is no ecosystem, even Amazon is it's being proven now, um, that approaches the robustness and the efficiency and, and, and the completeness of these retail ecosystems that were built in China. So the system wasn't built you know, to get through a pandemic, but it proved, you know, after some early chokeholds on logistics, in my opinion, um, in a large part, helped the country from de de descending into further chaos, you know, where people are on the streets uh, looking for food. I mean, this was, this was a major, major, major thing. And, you know, the biggest complaint here in the U.S. right now is, you know, you can't get an Amazon delivery time. You can't get an Instacart delivery time. You got to be up at two o'clock in the morning to get a Peapod delivery time. Well, that's not surprising. And that's not really the fault of these com companies, right? Even to Amazon uh, to some degree, because prior to COVID, only five to seven percent of all grocery items were bought online in the U.S. So, all of a sudden you have a system that was built for 7% demand dealing with 80% demand. Uh, of course it's not going to work. Whereas China was already doing 40% of those purchases online. So scaling from 40% to 80% um, meant it was a lot easier. To, it was a lot easier to scale from 40 to 80% than from five to 80%. In general, what were some of the consumer trends you saw in China during the COVID-19 outbreak that you think will be replicated around the rest of the world? Some consumer behaviors in China have been permanently altered. And, and I think one of them is, you know, we were looking at what we thought, you know, from our research might be a 60% of all, um, you know, tier one, two and three city purchases, having a digital element, you know, getting there in, in maybe three years or so, uh, four years, I, I think, you know, we're probably a year to 18 months from looking at 60 to 75% of purchases being done digitally. There's going to be this stay at home culture. Uh, you know, we do a lot of work at our firm for food and beverage and wine and spirits companies. And um, we also do work for companies who make the equipment and small appliances and home. And, and so we've seen this kind of boom in small appliance, home goods, uh, imported foods that, you know, there's just gonna be this stay at home culture. I think that we're gonna see more of that here as well. Uh, you know, the, the question I keep asking myself and, and, and others who I talk to is, well, okay, let's just, you know, um, let's think positively and say on June 1st, the U.S. gives the green light and says, okay, businesses can open again, everybody can go out again, uh, resume, uh, resume your normal lives. Well, that's nice, but how many people by June or July are gonna say, yeah, I'm gonna go to restaurants the way I used to, I'm gonna go to bars the way I used to, I'm gonna go to, um, you know, outdoor, um, uh, you know, swimming parks and amusement parks. And uh, I'm going to go to the mall and I'm, you know, just, I think there's going to be a lag on <laughs> when it's okay to go out uh, to how people actually make their choices and feel about that. 
Um, you know, do, do you, do you feel like you're looking at your, over your shoulder when you're at a hot, sweaty, pulsing nightclub? I, I don't know, but I think there's, there's just going to be a lot of wariness here. Um, and I think the way people interact in social spaces, the way people interact in, in physical retail spaces, I think the way, um, company set up and treat you know that's something we didn't even talk about is you know the employees you know the heroes who are showing up at the local grocer and convenience store and the the postal and ups and fedex guides who are who are on the front lines keeping a lifeline to to europe and to north america and and, and to other countries um you know i hope one of the positive changes coming out of this is people um get a better appreciation for what those people do and, and how important they are to our society are you seeing any interesting data points emerging from the chinese market that are particularly notable and important for global brands to know about well you know like i said we're, we are seeing um uh, a pretty pretty significant uptick in home goods and appliances uh, imported food and beverage um, so we, we've definitely seen that change um, I, I think we we've also seen traffic um, on um, social media platforms increase um, I, I think also People are definitely rethinking brands and, and the brands who have served them well. Um, you know, prior to this crisis, you know, Chinese consumers had one overriding demand, which was spoil me or else, <laughs> or else I will find a platform, a brand, a company, um, a KOL, a celebrity who will. And so I think that that has accelerated where um, you really need to be prepared to deliver uh, to the consumer, you know, those four C's it's, you know, consumer centricity, uh, customization, convenience, and maybe even more importantly, more than ever, allowing them to contribute to who, what you are. Um, and, and so I think that's that's something that's really important for for brands and, and retailers to understand. Uh, and then I would also say the the need for more intense localization of your product and your messaging. Um, I think that's become uh, even more important through through the crisis too. Um, that you know people really in a time of fear and uncertainty really need to feel comfortable and in touch with and on the same um, psychographic plane with the products and brands they're engaging in with, excuse me. I'd like to close with a discussion uh, around looking at how much has the world changed. If we go back to something that we learn in, in business school a lot, it which is a discussion around the most expensive shelf space in a supermarket or a Target or a Walmart is beside the diapers. And the reasoning is because when a woman is pregnant, there's no singular time in a potential consumer's life cycle as a consumer that they are most susceptible and willing to change brands. Because when you get pregnant, it upends everything about uh, your world, especially as a mother, as a, as a mother to be, where you will change everything about the way you live inside body and outside body. And I don't believe that we have seen something of this magnitude in almost a hundred years where brands market share or their grip on market share has been as tenuous as it possibly is today. I think coming out of the pandemic, everybody will have changed and nobody's going to really know how or how much or in what, what area or what vertical. So have you, have we seen something like this? Where do you think it's going to go? What is the impact going to be? first let's deal with the point you know has anything like this ever happened before and the, the answer is no for for one simple reason the last major global pandemic was you know 1918 with the, the spanish flu um at that time there was no super cohort of consumers anywhere in the world right consumer hyper consumerism first emerged in post world war ii united states right the u.s was 
virtually the only country uh, in, involved in the war that was physically left standing and intact. It was the country that emerged the strongest. Um, much of Asia was in ruins. Much of Western Europe and Europe and Russia were in ruins. And so Americans had the ability to make the products that the world needed and the insatiable desire to consume those products and the ability to do so. So if we think about the first era of super consumers, it was that consumer culture that evolved uh, post-World War II, and it was the world's first hyper-consumer culture. The second group of super consumers to emerge globally were the Chinese consumers who emerged in the 2000s and 2010s. So my first book was called China's Super Consumers, right? And so I likened the emergence of the Chinese consumer class in the 2000s to that which emerged um, in post-World War II America. We have not had a global crisis of this proportion since those two consumer classes emerged um, over the last 80 years. And so we've, we've never seen a world with two um, super consumer classes and then, you know, Europe kind of being in that mix too, um, where so much of the world is much more engaged in buying the things they want and not just need. This is the first disruption of its kind to break down the consumer world order that's been built, especially over the last 35 years. Um, and I think <clears throat> there's going to be a lot of fallout in terms of how globalization plays a role uh, in the way we make, move, sell, and buy everything. Uh, it seemed like we were on a uh, unstoppable freight train headed down the tracks to complete global integration of making, moving, selling, and buying. I think that that, um, that train could go off the rails here in, in a post-COVID world. So I, I think the opportunity, and it's one that I've been touting for years, um, is now is the time to rethink how you make, move, sell, and buy. And if you didn't believe me a year ago or six months ago, I hope you believe me now, because now is a great time to step back and say, how do we change all of that? And I think you're going to see a lot of brands and a lot of startups and an incredible number of innovations come out of this crisis. Um, I think it's just accelerating what was already happening, which was um, shuffling the old, tired, boring, middle of the road, non-technological retail and consumption models uh, off the stage and ushering in this, this new era. But, 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 and here's the key, I think what's really cool about this is it's giving smaller companies, individuals, entrepreneurs, the opportunity to play a role here. And I don't think that, you know, just having an Amazon, Walmart, Target um, at the top is going to be sufficient. And, and I think there's just an incredible opportunity to create new ways of doing business from all of this. Couldn't agree more, my friend. Michael, thank you for coming on the show once again, and hopefully we'll do a part three sometime soon. Thanks for having me. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation. And if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co. And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jian.